Aperture. Please help me in welcoming Tommy and Tommy. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. We wanted to thank Aperture. Um, should we pass one of the books around in the audience? Yeah. 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 Uh, we'll do this. Should we do that one? That way you can see uh, most of uh, my, my image uh, here, not blocked out by a book. Um, but yeah, um, I'd like to quickly thank uh, Kaman and Arthur uh, for helping put this together with Alex and Sophia from Aperture here. Uh, 7G Foundation for the uh, funding the, the book and Next Step Award. Um, and we're gonna try to remember everybody. I have to remember to say this, like Baxter Street and um, Aperture Foundation for everything, honestly. Um, can you, everyone hear me? Are you okay? Yeah, all right. Um, hello. Hello, well, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for making this work and congratulations. Um, everyone, go see the show at Baxter Street, Ghost Bites. It just opened last week and it'll be up for a few more weeks. Yeah, it will close March 22nd. Mm -hmm. And yeah, gosh. And we're passing around the book. And please stick around after the talk. There will be a book signing uh, around the corner in the bark room. Um, but so we have, we have a lot to talk about. We, talked about talking about this. I have a bunch of questions for you. We'll see what we can get through. Yeah. The first question I have for you is, there's a lot of work in this book. Yes. It's like 10 years worth of work here. Yep. And I mean, I've known your work for longer than that. Can you just, just describe that process of sitting with 10 years worth of work, the different bodies of work, the different periods of time that you went through, and how did you even go about starting to think through the edits and to think through the sequencing? Um, like, can you just talk through that process a little bit? Yeah, um, so the Next Step Award was, is nomination only, and I, I just never had a, apart from Thomas Palmer's bookmaking class at Yale, like, I really didn't have a lot of um, experience putting a book together, nor uh, I gra graduated from Yale in 2013. Um, I spent maybe until, 2018, 2019, just like coasting, I'd say. I was still making pictures, but uh, paint you a picture like Chelsea Galleries or like, you, your work doesn't make sense. This is uns isn't sellable. Um, you should totally make work just being about Asian, being Asian. It's like, cause you know, we could talk about that, but if it's like about the South, about queerness and Asian, like that's like, that's really impossible to sell. And it's like, I'm not worried about, so I mean, I love to make uh, money, but uh, that you know wasn't my concern, and like that was just like the same. I want to say that because it was a lot of rejection. A lot of people were telling me that my work w wasn't didn't make sense. I think some of that is very true, and but I like satisfying curiosity. Uh, Dorothy Parker said, uh, "The cure for boredom is curiosity. There's no cure for curiosity." Um, so I, uh, she's really great wit, uh, wit, wit. wit wittiest person um, and uh, immediately the announcement December 2021 um, I sat with Leslie um, planning what were what the next few months would would be like um, Leslie was probably and usually works like seven book productions at a given time I think um, so I didn't want to waste anyone's time and this is like uh, I basically my first mistake was sending a very select few things from each body of work that was related to what could be go, go in. So not really a broad edit. Um, and then we kind of, for, I forgot to put in important photographs when we made the first sequence. Like, wait, there's a ton of stuff missing. Oh no, you're referring, oh, I should have given you everything. Also I had a really bad filing system and I thought I was really well organized. Um, so that was pretty much that, like trying to make sense of what was going on and Leslie, I really thank so much because she's the only person that really took on the challenge of a lot of when I was exhibiting people were only showing certain pictures that made sense with each other. A lot of like I did one thing and they just took in other photographs that did had very similar strategies so cutouts only no like none of the other weird stuff. Um, but Leslie is like the first person to just like look went in looked at like all these bodies of work and then just made an edit and was like holy 
wow, this is this actually reads really well. And I always I seen like someone like wrote Efridge borrow pictures from previous bodies of work and then putting bringing them forth into a new project and recontextualizing that same image in a different um, new body of work. And I really wanted that intertwiningness. It was really important because um, I think I, I was really. It's easy to say photography is about time, about memory, about the past, because that's essentially what it is. Um, I want to take it a little bit step further, and it's like, it's time traveling. Even thinking about history of photography, looking at photographs have influenced the way that we make pictures. Um, and often, when I was brought up in Memphis, uh, College of Art, where I was only shown very certain photographers, Eggleston, Sally Mann, Christian Berry. Um, those were like the, those were the, the godfathers, godmother of the sub, what Southern pictures look like. Um, so that was something that followed me into school. And this, the edit for the book was just like, oh, yes. And it was important to intertwine my mom's work, especially uh, because I wanted to reinforce the idea that how much things had occurred in the past, right? History repeats itself kind of way, but um, how much of it still plays a role in making our pictures today. So like the past kind of still haunts this contemporary present. There's so many ways where we can go because we yes. can talk about the South, yeah. we can talk about place and the landscape in relation to family and history, mm -hmm. Asian American history. And when we talk about Asian American history, it's also American history. Yep. We can go back to the Chelsea gallerists that are saying, oh, we can't compute a framework where you're Asian and queer from the South, right? Um, mm -hmm. But we don't want to give airtime to those people. Yeah. But I also want to talk about what does it mean to like even think about time traveling? Mm -hmm. And even the show at Baxter Street, Ghost Bites, and like, how do we talk about this how do we talk about intergenerational trauma? How do we talk about knowledge? Mm -hmm. Knowledge that is passed down, that it's primordial, that is ancestral. Mm -hmm. Then this idea of unpacking and tracing these lineages and these gaps, right, in between. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's not a question. This is like, I'm just throwing some balls in the air. <laughs> um, like thinking about the American South and thinking about, you know, there's, a, there's like photographs in that book where we're looking at truly like an American landscape, but then there's a hint of bamboo or it's um, mm -hmm. a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. And how these are, there are these signifiers, but we know, we know we're fully placed in America. Like just as chop suey, like mm -hmm. you're in the book, yep. just as American as hamburgers and fries. Yep. Right? Yeah. Um, and it's just, a lot of these histories is really kind of recent. Um, my mom's photograph was a recent discovery, 2016. She just randomly gifted me pictures, and I didn't know she made pictures at all. And it's there's no negatives. It was just like, what the heck? Maybe we'll go into the next slide. I, I forget what. Look at yeah. the slides. Wait. Yeah, there's some pictures of the book. Um, so actually, it's kind of funny. The 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 size of it is actually based. Uh, the width of it was based on the William Eggleston guide, and we just decided to make it taller to accommodate the four five um, ratio of many of the pictures. There's four bodies of work, uh, and I kind of love like uh, I like traditional subtleties and I made a suggestion of like doing something perforated for the book and then we ended up with having um, a mask insert so I'm like this is great like people can just wear my face and just be me this is the closest well actually I had my identity stolen before so maybe not the best joke to make um, but it was really a big challenge to like I don't want my work to be just about the American land southern landscape and the conflicts there um, but also using like or bringing in my mom's work bringing in our collaboration over the last 10 years um and then um making all these like other photo um, photographs make sense with each other um yeah i mean we have the cutouts of me myself as a subject as a cutout um because i got really tired going back and forth um in front of the camera behind the camera um and these are um uh, Studio Lynn did the des design, and with Leslie, they did a uh, way to co codify, I guess is a way, or a way that you can easily passively realize that they're from different bodies of work based on size and position on it. So the cutout works like here, the collaboration, the cardboard, and the costume drama on the um, my right hand, my right side of the screen um, are 
I think position on to the right uh, to denote that they're from the facades, the cutout work. Um, and then my mom's photographs are kind of kept to the same um, size and how they originally appear. Um, yeah, uh, where do we go from there? Um, can we go to the puzzle picture? Oh yeah. This is like, uh, a lot of this work was mostly exhibited, maybe like, uh, printed in some publications, but, um, and this book is the first time, like, all of my work has been seen in a, like, in a near totality of, like, this is the main sampling of what I've been thinking of, and it's such still a beginning for me on, uh, uh, on my process and tying it all together, uh, the fragmentation. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna ask this question, because this is, like, this is a question we talk a lot with, we talk about in, you know, with our students, too, in the program, like, yep. what, you know, in, in, the, in the body of work or in four bodies of work or a span of time of 10 years, mm -hmm. and, in, and then the, the next step award, you know, like, what are the new directions in the work? What's a departure for you? And then at the same time, what remains at the core? What's that thread mm -hmm. that keeps, you know, tugging, you know, throughout the 10 years worth of work, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's very biographical, very, uh, like, I'm the main um, through line of it, but I really didn't want to make a book of just self-portrait work, because I kind of gave up on, like, trying to make one thing a while ago, and I think being rejected and being largely ignored before 2018 um, was was really beneficial, despite being it really hard and difficult at times, and it felt really like no one was paying attention to or trying to understand what I was doing, and I think it benefited a lot just because I kept going and kept making pictures not knowing what it, were they going to be, and I ended up with really a lot of work that is... Um, kind of hits a lot of like what I want about, what I think about snapshot, what I think about American Southern landscape, which is really incredibly hard to make a non-problematic picture in the American South, because the acknowledgement of black spaces, for example, it's like I don't have an authority over that, but I need to acknowledge that the, the, the space is not just one history, and that it's not, not just an Eggleston, it's not Christian Berry, it's not these white men anymore. Um, and not to like really get rid of them, I'm friends with Eggleston still, and there have been really supportive folks in my life uh, that pushed me into like, where, where, where can this go? Um, and the, yeah, the third line is just, I guess, having, um, is about, fragmentation. The landscape is fragmented. It's a palimpsest. It's like I described a lot of the landscape and the human body as palimpsest. So I said this earlier in the class, but it's a when uh, Egyptian priests, I guess, bookmakers would just like paint over pages and just reuse them and write new text on top of it. And I think that's how identity is played out. It's like we are always, always going to be looked or perceived differently by everybody. Your family is going to look at you or treat you or interact with you differently than your friends, your classmates. And so I think like identity is just unfixed to begin with. Like there's no, as a lot of times that's why like like this, my pictures appear so differently with different strategies because it's more like it doesn't matter how, uh, how how dissimilar that these are. There are like some connections um, between uh, generational trauma, the uh, the difference between my mom's way of making pictures, which is very celebratory, very like, hey, I survived a war and I'm in a new country where I can do stuff and accumulate seven up cans and because that wasn't available to them. And now like I'm educated, uh, which is more ironic because that wasn't available for my mom. A lot of immigrants don't have a relationship to art or photography in that way. So it's like just this juxtaposition um, to begin with is like how vastly different our treatment to the camera and photography is within a generation. This is like, we, we talked about the at the Higher Picture Show, but can you talk a little bit more about working with your mom as a collaborator and how you've, you've often described these portraits as like half self-portraits? Mm -hmm. And even, or even this piece, which is literally both of your faces together. Yeah, I, I mean, I made the, I made puzzle portraits. Arthur asked this earlier, and it's like I really didn't want to be so gimmicky about my work, and like I don't want to be known to make just puzzles. And there's definitely other artists that use puzzle portraits way better than I am, and I like. Uh, my idea is that photography can manifest itself in the world th 
besides being a straightforward print framed on the wall, like we can all do that. We're very capable of doing that. I'm like really excited about what photography can be and what has always been there. Um, um, well, maybe we can go back to this other question of like what, what can we learn from photographs, right? Like it's so fascinating to hear that your mom finally gifted you these photographs mm -hmm. where it's in the book and it's like, these joyous pictures where she's like holding these stuffy, this like teddy bear, giant teddy bears and with, with other people, mm -hmm. um, you know, can you, can you just talk about, can you talk a little bit about how in that process of looking at her way, like her way of making images of herself, mm -hmm. did that inform how you started, you know, how you were working with her after that? Mm, I think it kind of s stayed the same because my mom is very, uh, I think with a lot of Asian parents' mom especially or immigrant p parents that they are very secretive or private about things that they've experienced. Um, a lot of stuff that like waking up as a child and my grandmother screaming, it's because it's like, oh, that's PTSD. I did not know the word for that or the letters for that. <laughs> uh, and the same thing with my mom and just like why is this so... Uh, uh, there's just been these echoes of things that kind of um, through photography and revisiting these experiences, revisiting childhood um, um, spaces um, with a better understanding of it. And it's still like trying to learn. Um, my mom isn't the only family member I photograph. Most The general consensus is that everyone just runs away from me because it's just like, oh, no, Tommy's here, run, or put on makeup or better clothes because it's like he's going to take a picture of you and there's nothing that uh, they can do. Um, and my family kind of just put up with me with it because I, I, I think they know, like, this is what I do. Um, they explain it away, like, oh, uh, well, he's, they don't describe me as an artist, for example. They're just like, oh, a teacher. Oh yeah, that's that's very a, a very admirable job, um, according to my grandma. So, but her thinking is from 1930s. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much to try. No, no, teaching is amazing. Teachers should be paid more. Um, I want to be on record as saying that teachers should be paid more. Um, but these things are just like. I'm using the camera to, uh, they're, they're used to that. They're, now they have phones that can do camera work for them, but you know they definitely are treating f photography differently than how I was uh, educated. Mine's more performative. Mine's more like uh, making things or finding myself in the situation to be able to photograph those things, to understand like uh, the moments with my mom, she just like, knows when I'm in town and just like, I'm off today, do you wanna come over? I'll make food and we can make some pictures and that's basically how our collaboration goes. She doesn't look at the pictures, she just, she knows, but she doesn't, she's not someone that just re reflects on, on like her position. She knows it's important for me, um, to me and that it, well, she concluded that most art pictures are very sad because no one smiles. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, like, let me smile for one picture and then I'll do sad pictures, like not smiling pictures for a lot. So there's like some fun understanding about how, <laughs> what photographs are now for, for them. But it's still the same. They kind of like uh, just let me do it um, as long as I'm respectful and like not trying to like be in anyone's face. And that's been our relationship. <laughs> and, and you know, and in that, and that action and that gesture, it's out of love. Like, and you know, there's there's so much, there's moments when in these pictures she's pushing back, there's moments when, you know, there are these, there's moments of play and humor and she has such a wide range. Yeah. Um, and so just sort of following all of that is like, there is this, you, it's such a lovely thing to see her pictures from when she's 23 having just, you know, um, she landed in, in uh, London, Canada, or mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yep. Ontario, um, to this new work where she's looking into the camera yet holding the shutter, the mm -hmm. sh shutter release bulb in her mouth, you yeah. know, defiantly. You yeah, know? and that camera is on a self timer, so it's not like that shutter cable is definitely not attached to the camera. So it's like she's thinking that she's making her own picture, but it's like, but that's always been a strategy with everyone I shoot. It's like give them the shutter cable because it was at the time an extension of the photographer so it's just a shorthand way to like oh that's me that's a manifestation that's a, that shutter cable is an extension of the photographer but there is no camera operator because it's a self-timer mm -hmm. so the authorship things like that are kind of in the background to just play around with but yeah everyone knows like when you get out a camera like you see it people pose they adjust themselves we are so photography is so 
every day for us that we don't realize how much it has played out to how we subconsciously move up, do the chin down, make sure the camera's hot. And we're really smart than we... With the photo face, we don't smile, right? We don't smile, yeah, yeah. I mean, those things, that stuff is, prob is from pho photographic studio history because it, people had to hold still and I made kissing pictures that people had to hold still while they kissed me. That sounded really weird to say out loud, but that's actually what happened. Because uh, the shutter speed was really long. Yeah, they're long, they're long exposures. Yeah, some of these were long too. Everything's like, I, mean, I, don't, I don't Photoshop because I just don't have time. I mean, I do, but like color grading, but I just don't, I, if I don't end up with it, it's like I have to go back and make it, make it happen. I want to talk about, I want to talk about ghosts. Yes. I want to talk about diasporic making. Yep. <laughs> I want to talk about, you talked about PTSD. You talked about not knowing it. You talked about knowing what was happening but not having the words for it. This idea of knowledge being nonverbal mm -hmm. and this idea that this is passed down, right? From yeah. your grandmother to your mother. And what is talked about in Asian families and then what isn't talked about in Asian yeah. families. like. And then in the interview with Amile in the back of the book, you, you, you're, both of you are talking about the exodus and the journey and the escape and survival, mm -hmm. right? Like acts yeah. of survival, acts of, resilient, of resistance and resilience, and this idea of like language, right? But different forms of it. Yep. And you sort of just. Yeah, I'm gonna work my way backwards and reverse engineer that question. How's everyone We're doing? We're good. I'm yeah. just throwing words. At yeah, me. no. I mean, Amelie, yes. I asked for uh, Amelie specifically because I, we talked about it a lot. Um, yeah, my family stayed after the fall of Saigon, um, and this is the thing that I found out recently. Of using photography is just this research survey. I work with the Mississippi Delta Chinese community recently, Memphis Chinese community. I did not know about these folks until like. To around 2016 because someone thought to make a food channel about um, southern cooking but with a Chinese flair and I met a lot of these folks that um, Delta State University has a really big amazing library um, of uh, the Mississippi Delta Chinese community and so I asked Ami specifically if she would be interested and she said yes and I peed my pants I just kept peeing my pants I'm sorry not to be gross but that is just like she is a MacArthur winner and I'm just like not I'm not smart I'm just clever um, guys this I'm clever I'm a uh, clever photography is a genre I make I make up a lot of genres by the way um, but Amelia is like her family fled the helicopter uh, by helicopter. My family stayed. As a result, my mom was sent in place of my grandfather to a uh, re-education camp. So if you guys know a little bit about Vietnam history, it's uh, after the war, there's a lot of landmines. My mom had to clean the, the land and they did not know where the bombs were. So um, she spent about like I guess, what was it, 72, 73, say on. So by 83, 84, she just like up and left. Like um, Australia, uh, we almost went to Australia. That was great. Uh, and then she got rejected from France and then eventually uh, made her way to London, Ontario. Um, a lot of that stuff I'm kind of get bits and pieces, so that fragmentation. Like a lot of this information is just learned from childhood, revisiting information, interviewing my aunt who was a historian or the family historian. So it was really like I'm taking over that role now because no one else. And literally I cannot trace anything back before 1930. I don't know anything before what happened. Like uh, Japanese coming, that wasn't our main concern and the, my great grandparents just like, took the entire family and just went to Vietnam because it was a great idea in the 1930s. Like, you know, like yeah, there was no war yet, but there was, there was that theme. And then, you know, later on, my, fa my mom ran away. So my family has a lot of, uh, a long history of uh, fleeing countries. Um, and I came very close to doing that um, very recently with the election because it's, that, that was a real thing. I'm like, oh, this, I might have to go. Um, and the ghost is just, uh, ghosts, it's funny because um, we're both in photo no-no. I wrote something about I, uh, what we don't photograph and I wrote like, I don't photograph ghosts. Photography is already a modern day ghost hunting. I can't believe I'm remembering this, but I, I like that, you know, before there was a theory with photography being windows or mirrors. I like to think it's about possession and haunting. Possession, like we take in what, 
has historically been presented, we try to exorcism. Like that's the goal for us is to be on the next thing, to be making, um, finding that the new direction, not just our work, but pushing photography forward um, and excising that to create, uh, uh, I'm saying a lot of words right now, but a synthesis of yeah. new. We're excising, but we're also carrying all those people with us, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what photography is. That's time travel there. Mm -hmm. We're both possessed by the past and trying to move forward, but you know, no one's really put thought into the direction of a roadmap lately. So, you know, I'm just one piece of a larger thing. Can you talk about the title of the book? Yes. You know, like, and then the, or what, what the original title of the, of the book was, and then the, the new title, just like. Yeah. There was a lot of things going on, and um, it was originally called Soft Murders after Susan Sontag. I, Sontag is just someone I really go back and quote to a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Arthur, for running this. Uh, and I, um, we call, we ended up kind of steering away from the darkerness. Uh, my aunt was murdered in 1997 outside of Nashville uh, through gun violence. Uh, this book came right after, uh, like the thinking of this book came right after the Atlanta ball shooting and everything else that was happening. Um, so we, I did, we did end up with a different edit from the beginning, um, but there are two pictures that survived from the soft murders because we still wanted to honor um, what the original sequence was that like we did want that darker part, but they're so quiet. They're really like, I don't know. I just made them not thinking like they're really any good. Um, so it's really hard. They're just, they're definitely there. Um, so we decided on half full quarter um, based on how I was categorizing the, the work. Um, half being the half cell portrait, the collaboration between my mom and I, but they're not really strict categories. There's really four, but three, um, uh, the, the three wording in the title alludes to the categorization, but that's about, that's the point. Time is really, you know, not really about details, but like, recontextualizing the photographs in different ways. So you can literally take a photograph of mine and put it in a different body of work. And it might be out of place, but I like to accept that out of place. I've always been awkward. My work is about ultimately not belonging and that being okay. That cutout like of myself, that's the thing that's wrong about the picture. It's a real thing. It looks like it's Photoshop, but it's not. It's part of the picture, the part of the environment at that temporal time that I walked into the scene. But it is, these things are just a performance to the camera. These things are just very, uh, uh, it's always supposed to point to the thing that's out of place is usually me, usually my body and the picture itself, and trying to reinforce that. And then, but that out of placeness is so many things. So it's like, like on me, it says in the interview, um, the idea of the perfect imperfect place, mm -hmm. right? And then the idea that even the cutouts are never um, perfectly seamless, right? So we see the hand and we see the labor, yep. right? And so, but then also the ideas of belonging, yeah. right? And this, in this country <laughs> as a perpetual foreigner, as a professional other, mm -hmm. um, and how that is navigated sort of, you know, post, you know, the, the, the you know, um, not, it's not post because it's been going on since the Chinese Exclusion Act or even before that, the Page Act. Yep. Um, uh, but, you know, how, how all of that sort of comes out from even just looking at the yeah. series. Right? Yeah. It's not even intentional too. Like I didn't know like that. Like when Leslie put the the four pit bodies of work together, it's like no one thought to do that with me before. But it always made sense to me. But you know, trying to describe it to people is like uh, describing my Pinterest conspiracy theory board, cork board. I'm trying to combine Pinterest. To, I'm very with it these days. I am not. Uh, I try to like left no crumbs. Like it's like nope, not gonna try. We use DuckDuckGo instead of Google. <laughs> no, I don't oh, know. Okay. <laughs> I'm so. I I use Alfred, ask Jeeves like for a really long time just because he looks like. Use Quora.com. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about this picture. Yeah. Uh, this is an Art21 video. Yeah. Right? Uh, can you just, you know, uh, we've talked about like play and humor, right, and imagination, but can you just walk through this picture for, for folks who may or may not be familiar with this or the Art21 video? 
Yeah. It, uh, God, I, Gia Lee, who filmed it, was the director, filmmaker for it, and Carver, her partner, sound mixer dude. Oh my God, they put up with me so much. They filmed everything, but I love them. Um, and they, this came around when I was thinking of not trying to do something so straightforward with the cutouts and the mask being like these fragmentations of my body. The puzzles were operate in the same way. Um, so it dealt a lot about like how cutouts can be in other forms, like um, dress up and costumes. Costumes are stereotypical reduction of like uh, a character or sometimes a country's identity. And I think like, oh yeah, that's definitely a cutout. Um, this is a recreation of a childhood memory specifically of when um, uh, being child of immigrants were poor, um, so we couldn't afford costumes, so we all wore black garbage bags and just like called out our superhero name, um, but we all kind of just looked alike. <laughs> it's like in garbage bags. It's just a really sad thing, but the power of imagination. Um, and you know, I like I wanted to be Batman, um, but no one wanted me to do that because everyone wanted to be Batman. So I, I think it was just like Superman. So this was like my way to re write that wrong, but um, you can see the, still, the, still the same strategies of like the shutter cable, and then you see the end of the roll that should be attached onto the camera. It's just on the ground. It's like there's no. Oh, I want pictures to be to fall apart at the seams just so you know like it's not Photoshop there is things that is specifically constructed but you know things just don't work out too so I kind of go along with the realness that happens with photographing it's like sometimes it just doesn't work out but that 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 thing that doesn't work out it's like oh wait mm, yep yeah, this is something this is gonna be something I feel like I'm not answering the question so much because I go on tangents it's all good um, I have like front people are just like giving me references to like just answer the question directly and I really <laughs> try and it's like a tangent like this commentary right now. Um, I'm going to quote you right now. Oh. The act of picture making to me is a choreography. It's a dance between me and the camera and the space itself. I think for some people it's about trying to figure out figure themselves out in relation to a space where they belong where they should be standing. Photography is a compass for me. It's very grounding, a validation or confirmation that I was there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same reason my mom made those pictures, I assume. She doesn't talk about them, so I'm there to fill in the blanks. Like, uh, those pictures are very, like, celebratory. Could we go to one where it's, like, my mom's work? Uh, yeah, th that set. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many things that I just, like, how... She definitely gave the camera to some folks, but there's definitely a lot of pictures where it's just the lines are so straight. There, it's definitely on a tripod. Or, like, there's no way that someone can handhold everything and just still be making these compositions so modernistic. Um, uh, that that uh, but making this picture, she a lot of those pictures that she made were uh, birthday celebration things that you already made pictures of of your friends like celebration and that act of making a picture is to save that moment to also be as a, a way to mark time. Alison Bechtel talked about that in her lecture with Harvard l last year. Um, I like to think of it. She used a lot of photography as a marker of time, and I'm like, yeah, like it's a diary, but it's more than that. Um, and it's the same thing that I'm doing. Mine's more performative, of course, but it's also a marker of time. And uh, I mean, I, I definitely love that I describe, like, it's so easy to describe photography as time. And I'm like, I'm way beyond that, but it is about time. Well, there's a photograph in the show in Ghost Bites. I don't think it's on this. Is it on the slide where it's like, it's inside a Chinese takeout restaurant and there's a landscape within a landscape? Oh, yeah. Jackie Chan. Yeah, and then a bunch of um, I don't think I put it in calendars. We can describe it, um, and those, and just encourage you guys to come see in the show. Yeah, that was totally show. intentional. <laughs> the, a plug in there. Uh, yeah, I. It was New Lens Chinese on um, Pauline in between Midtown and Downtown Memphis, and it's part of that show. Uh, how different it is from the book. The book kind of came first in, in terms of sequencing and then putting it together, and then it went to press and at the end of August. Like, 
I had a, there's definitely some typos on my end that only I recognize, so it's totally fine. It's cool. It works out actually, um, and it's. Uh, but I love the the interior of the Chinese um, restaurants, and that's like one of the new subjects of my space because it's like uh, a lot of fast chi food Chinese restaurants. The interiors are almost always peppered with these stereotypical Asian landscapes of like, and that is a representation of old ways of thinking about um, East meets West or West is versus East. We know that's not true. There's definitely nuances and divisions that we have come up, um, but honestly, uh, for example, no one in China calls uh, uh, the, the West Occidental or Occidents. Um, uh, things like that just comes up. Um, but. I wanted to continue making those um, pictures and inadvertently started to think about them unconsciously. Um, there's a Jackie Chan. He's such an asshole. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we were talking about it earlier. Yeah. Let's like, elaborate on that. Yeah, there's this really great. I just love that it is this creation of old and new with the uh, continuous new Chinese restaurants. And almost always, there's these like very exotic looking Chinese landscapes inside. So I think it's a nice like old meets new um, all in one. And the set space is already set up there. I just walked in on it. I literally uh, drove up, it's raining, pressed my camera against the glass, took uh, a picture and then ran away. <laughs> so um, most times you can probably imagine me running away and it's really dorky. Like it's just like if, if I, if, oh God. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I mean, so then there's these family snapshots. Inside. Yep. Right? Yeah. Um, and then these calendars are from all different years that they're just saving the top part, right? And then there's Jackie Chan. <laughs> yeah. I try to crop him out, but it was just like, I think I have to keep him for it, uh, that. But I mean, maybe to elaborate on Jackie Chan is like what he represents to certain people or certain generations. And yeah. So for my parents' generation, he represented some sort of commercial success that everyone wanted to aspire to, yeah. or being able to cross market to like yeah. work in Hong Kong and work in Hollywood. And yeah. but he's, <laughs> we have our opinions about him. Yeah, I, he's not my. Talk about assimilation. Yeah, Jackie Chan, bam, assimilation. Let's talk about that a little bit. And yeah, you talk about it in the interview with Ami, but just to you know, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was this thing that we were supposed to aspire towards mm -hmm. and then how that conversation has uh, shifted now, right? And yeah, yeah, it was a big mistake to like, oh, you should only learn English to, uh, to better assimilate with your classmates. I mean, I went to public school, so um, I don't, <laughs> I remember uh, being t taken from first grade to a weird meeting that I wasn't sure what was going on and they made me uh, read a wordless, textless, Aesop's Fable, The Crow and the Pitcher, to make sure I could speak English, because I was just like not interested in talking to anybody. I was a little asshole. I was in ESL until fifth grade. Oh, yeah. what? Yeah, no, mine's just like, we just want to make sure that you can actually speak. It's like, no, I just, no one really interests me. It's like, that's a really great thing to say as a first grader. It's like, uh, and, uh, I just, I mean, but those are the things that I grew up with. I went to an all black school, um, Graceland Elementary, that no longer there. Uh, and I think of that experience because I wasn't really treated by my classmates any differently. We're just kids. We don't have that language of division. But as I grow, grew older, older, you kind of start realizing like people are using coded ways to say how different you are. So a lot of times people comment on my my eyes a lot, not knowing that's what they're like trying to spell out. Oh, you're different. Um, let's let's go back to where do we go back to? Let's go back to this, right? Like um, like I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep pushing the Baxter Street show. Yeah, um, should we go to, oh yeah, so we're towards that side. You know, what, what I've noticed in this, in this book and mm -hmm. also in the new show at Baxter Street, that's, that's a, feels like a departure is that literally it's less self-portraits. Yep. It is more involvement of the community. Yep. All the photographs of the shrines that are in all these spaces that are mostly mom and pop shops. Mm -hmm. There was the one, that was projected here that seemed like a Asian uh, grocery store, like oh, yeah. a grocery store that yeah. had a shrine. That blue one with the big um, Buddha. To um, the other photographs at the Baxter Street show, mm -hmm. to the the um, 
the community uh, project that's in the second part, in the cafe part. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that new direction? And yeah. It's really crazy. I don't have, um, I was coming out of uh, the World Trade Center Civil Arts Residency and like, um, so I didn't have a studio at the time to imagine what the show was gonna look like. So everything kind of lived in my head, um, sketching them out on post-its, I'm not kidding. And it's like the curator, Don Chan, who's really amazing too. Um, everyone at Baxter is just like, this sounds crazy. Uh, but I had the idea of having a through line with the shrines, which not all of them are published, but I wanted to do something with a lot of these pictures I made over the years that still tie into the book, but present them in an interesting way. It's like, I can make an, a photograph easily. Uh, can we go to this first one of these? Uh, yeah. Uh, straightforward photograph framed, mounted on the wall, and I wanted to see, like, play with literally with the photographs as these objects, these representation, of the shrines is literally a anachronistic practice. It's Taoist. It's not Buddhist. It's tied into ancestral Chinese folk magic kind of thing. I forget what Wikipedia calls it. It sounds really dumb. Chinese folk religion, I think, is the official name. Uh, but, you know, it. I love that it's a photograph of a literal thing of the past that's supposed to tap into the past. So literally, it's like a, pa a picture, a, a past thingy of the past. And, but, but also, also, here, like 2023, right? Yeah. And, and then, like, we con I consciously wanted to make the pic the smaller pictures to go behind the frame, so there are mm -hmm. stuff behind um, the frame stuff that, I like the idea of hidden concealment with photographs, things that you don't necessarily have to see, it's not necessary to know um, either, but I like the idea to, like, how those pictures are kind of really intertwining with the contemporary photographs, these new things that I'm trying to do, because it's almost, we're almost always still haunted by our past, these things that we don't even know about, um, that I, I'm still trying to uh, figure and put a name to. Yeah, it was fun. I really just like wanted to have an excuse to bend photographs. I know some of the book kind of does it already with like a full spread and like the bend of the fold is there um, and how to translate that into a gallery wall was really fun. But it's very terrifying because it's like, I don't know if this is gonna work out and literally the community show um, in the Project Cafe space came out of like my thought, like I knew the show was happening. Um, it's in Chinatown, it's Baxter Street at the Camera Club of New York, it is on Baxter Street off Canal. It's in the middle of Chinatown proper, and it sounds so absurd to me to have a solo show and not have some, originally the theme um, thinking of the show was community, family. It starts with, um, I like that I wasn't prepared, but also this uh, die sublimation piece on the floor um, that you see. You sh should totally check it out. I know I like, should be more prepared with the slides. That's but like my favorite part, yeah. Yeah, we're just gonna tease it. Yeah, you should gonna... totally go see. But it was really important to, like, if I'm gonna talk about community and have a solo show in Chinatown where a lot of horrible, fucking things have happened to us um, in the last couple of years and that stuff that has played out in the 90s with my aunt being murdered outside of Nashville. It's like, that same shit's still happening, you know? So it's was really important to just not make it about me. I, I made pictures of the disposable camera, so I gave Kama one just now before we started to hopefully convince you to not put you on the spot. <laughs> you don't have to do it, too. Uh, you can give it to someone else. But I wanted to, I have a pictures behind the, 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 the cafe. Uh, my pictures behind everyone else's pictures because it, like, literally need to make my voice less important in that and to make, like, everyone else has different perspectives. I wanted, um, API friends of mine in the last year. So that pic that project started after Michelle Gao and um, Christina Yuna Lee were murdered. I was already like had all these disposable cameras ready to start, and it's like, well, I'm going to give. This. Last year, t yesterday was just one year from mm -hmm. the murder. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there's some secret pieces in the show too. There's a family photo album that you can request from the gallery to look at. I made pictures of that shrine over the few weeks that was up um, as part of uh, a New York Times thing, but they never picked it up. But also didn't feel good about hanging those pictures because it's just, but it's there in case people were interested. Um, I like making secret pieces. Maybe it's time to open up to questions, questions from the Yeah, audience. take this mic away from me. <laughs> no, 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 you're keeping, no. <laughs> you're keeping the mic. Uh, 
I have to answer everyone's question. Um, I see some of you guys. Well, some of y'all were my uh, were my students in the previous past. So this is my demeanor on stage. Isn't nothing new to you guys. So, um, so thank you guys. Raise your hand if you have a question. I'll pass you the mic so we can all hear you. Thanks, Alex. Hello. Okay, hi. Um, how did the dialogue of trauma and like sort of like specifically generational trauma change as your mother became more comfortable like using the camera and like how her work changed over time? I don't think she ever got comfortable. It was something like an activity that my family play. It's, it's the same activity that we participate in. Um, the act of making pictures with me um, is pretty normal and no one really tends to question it. It's really me, I'm asking the generational trauma thing and figuring out like why am I reacting this way. There are times where I just like walked around and something triggered me and I have no idea what that was. And it's like, oh, it's probably because of this thing um, like from the past that has affected me. It's a lot more, lot more involved answer than that. But um, it's still something I'm trying to figure out. But the easiest way is a comparison, intertwining my mom's work um, with my own. And then it was really surprising to see a lot of things that I was already doing, not knowing about her work. So a lot of these, these pictures are relatively new, but also being made before she gifted me those pictures. And then it's like, oh, aha, I can use this as a kind of a of uh, 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 I guess like a pinpoint check mark check point to kind of really spell out the difference between like that generational trauma for me translated to how different we treated the camera and how we photographed ourselves and like it's just for her it was celebration it's sur and a part of that was because she survived you know mine's just uh, recreation restaging pr performing for the camera to g kind of get different results all together but there's some parts that play out. Um, uh, like her sitting around photographing her friends, uh, I do that too and do my own work. The, that's a really terrible broad example. Uh, but um, how much of like my mom is this kind of performer, how much that uh, the things I'm really concerned with that she was also thinking about too in different ways. So I don't know. I think it was something that was easy to do visually to draw like why we, why we did the scale change for my work and then kept the, the her pictures relatively close to how I discovered them. And yeah, hopefully that was something. It's not a really satisfying answer, but that's something it's, it's ongoing, you know. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Um, I'm from Collierville, and oh, I, used shit. To, <laughs> I used to do stuff for the Memphis Chinese Association. Um, so I'd love to hear more about um, your relationship with the South, and mm -hmm. also like if it's shifted, and if your understanding of Memphis has shifted as you photographed it. Yeah, uh, so Collierville is a suburb of Memphis, and it's uh, it's so fun when I meet people from not from Memphis proper, but they're like on the outskirts, like Bartlett or Germantown. Um, I still think it's something I still return to. I still go back. My family still lives there, and I love the idea that the South is already this kind of myth made place. It's something that people believe is stuck in the past, but we know like if you go to Nashville or Houston, Austin, Texas, Atlanta, they're really, these urban cities are progressing and have a lot of like liberal progressive ideas. Um, at the same time, the South is really known to be, I guess like, I won't go back to being stuck in the past, being frozen in the past. It's supposed to be uh, uh, a lot of histories that kind of fight each other. Um, and so it's one of the things that I ran into was how do I make photographs in the South that is respectful to histories that are not my own? Um, and also trying to incorporate uh, a Chinese 
Association and the Delta, Mississippi Delta. They're next, they're next. They've been working with them, but I haven't really figured out um, what the execution would be yet. But they're in there in this book. They've also helped me out in posing for the, the work because um, they want to include them in some way. And so that was like the deal ultimately was to acknowledge these spaces rather than be uh, uh, someone that is knowledgeable about it. It's not like, that's not my point. That's like, I think it's way Dutch worse to ignore black spaces and especially if you're going to make work in the south like it's very it's not it's really hard to throw not to do that and not acknowledge and i think it does a disservice to um, the history of southern landscape southern photography in general if we don't acknowledge that there are other people that have been making work baldwin lee just got a resurgence um, of his work he stopped making pictures after the 80s um, but uh, i love that he showed a way to like he said what he wanted to say and he stopped, he still taught, but it was like largely ignored for about 20 years. It's like he made the last picture in 84 or something like that, maybe 89, but uh, that, yeah, I think it's something that I'm still continuously grappling with. It's why I still go back. It's not because my family, it makes it easy that my family is still there, my grandmother's still there. Um, but you know, I do see the changes of this space itself. And what I said about landscape and the body being palimpsest, it's like, it's continuous. The idea of the, t the South being frozen in time is definitely still true. You just have to know where to look for them. Um, and I think that's how I set up towards the end of the book is the beginning of the book is uh, one of the first photographs is with water, my hands coming out, um, referencing the, the artist's hand. And then the second picture was supposed to be the first is a photograph of my mom reading pattern drafting, a sewing book. So I always equate that to be a Louise Bourgeois. She always treated her mom as like this weaver, the spider is a, is a surrogate for her mom and that she is the ultimate genesis of the storyteller. So I've really wanted to place that at the beginning, but also to tie it back at the end, you'll see a lot of, I think it starts with the flood, flooded picture, which she might see, I'm just gonna do it. It's fine, it's fine. Um, the flooded picture, that was the last photograph I made of Memphis in 2011 before I moved to attend Yale. Um, and we had a terrible flood, but like all creation myths, it starts with a flood destruction and then towards the end. So there was really, and then something that is, the flooding is very, very sovereign thing that happens periodically. It's devastating. It's really not, like that was one of the worst floods um, when I was leaving. And I really thought it was important to acknowledge that as well. Like things that really tied in with not just my own, but things that are really already sort of there. So long. I'm so sorry. I hope that's it. I'm interesting sounding when I answer these questions. Yay! I just go on tangents. I just want to talk all the time. Um, anyone else have more questions? Um, are there any other like life moments, like the Batman photo, the story behind the Batman photo, that may have inspired like a piece of work? or a project or even like a current event that made, might have sparked an idea? Oh, uh, I can't really think of one specifically, but you know, um, I, made a, I made a lot of work uh, at the beginning after school, after Yale, um, and not knowing like where those things would take me, but I was really happy I made those pictures. Um, like I, I guess one example specifically is uh, when I was shooting view camera, I had a, a cardboard cutout of Elvis in my car, uh, not to cheat with the speed lane. I have said that, but I've only done that once. Uh, but it was to pull focus and have something, because doing self-portrait work is very isolating experience. If you don't have help, you often are working by yourself, and to do that with a view camera is insane. Um, and that, I made pictures of that cardboard cutout Rekha Rissinger, Danny Gordon, Michelle Abels were all doing these kinds of collage -y kind of works and there's also a collage section of all the pictures kind of broken down and put together in case uh, that was more of a Hail Mary in sequencing. It's like if I didn't include the photograph at least is somewhere in the collage portion of it. Also they wanted me to write by the way sidebar and that was my response. It's like I'll just give you some collage work but even then I'm really thankful for that part because it was like oh yeah I'm already doing that. The cardboard cutout is already this collage material anyway. 
Um, so when I started to make cutouts of myself as um, sub as a subject, it was like it really harkened back to something I did six years ago at Yale, but was too afraid to do it because I didn't want to look like I was ripping off Reka or Danny or Michelle um, because there was a lot of like. I don't know, trying to figure out how to make my own work, but everyone wanted, was expecting Eggleston for some reason because I was from Memphis, so dust I had, and I was buddies with him, and it's like, you should make these works. Like, no, I just wanna make my own stuff, even though they're terrible, um, but I'm really glad like I made them because I just didn't know at the time, and when I looked at them, especially during lockdown, it's like, oh. I was already thinking about this 10 years ago. So it's just, if anything, it's like keep going, but the things you do, you never know that it'll come back and like um, tell you like you already were thinking about that. Yeah, so it's going back to like what still remains of the core, mm -hmm. like sort of nagging questions that might not have been answered when you were in grad school, but you were still working through those ideas. Yeah, and that's why the show is called Ghost Bites. It's a, something my aunt would use. I didn't know it was a Vietnamese phrase until I looked it up and um, ghost bites was like something, um, I was in the hospital a lot as a kid, uh, and I had these unexplained bruises at times, and so she would say, oh, a ghost bit you. And that's how you got, got these unexplained bruises, and I was like, oh, and now years later, it's like inherited trauma. <laughs> that's what it is. Um, but we're always just haunted by that, by those questions, and we're just followed by these ghosts. And photography doesn't really help with that case because it's super, super ghost hunty. <laughs> if you think about it, we're just really hunting ghosts. It's like I should really retract my photo no no definition. <laughs> so, uh, anyone else? Yeah, more questions. Oh, uh, sorry. So. I feel like a lot of your work is very creative and unorthodox, and I think it's very interesting. I'm gonna quote you real quick. Uh, photography, you said that photography can man itself beside being a regular print on the wall. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask, um, what's your creative process and thought process when approaching a new body of work? Uh, be curious and just satisfy it. I mean, there's, uh, the curiosity is gonna come from you, and it's definitely something that you pay attention in class or maybe not, or picked up later, but satisfy that curiosity. Uh, I know things are really kind of, a lot of things are going on in the world, but trust photography, those of you guys in that, or in your medium of your choice, like it is something worth exploring because no one else is doing that. No one is exploring that curiosity. Um, and that's how I really start. And if you guys are asking about how I get inspiration, I walk a lot and play uh, a oblique strategies. Um, basically, I distract my mind so I don't look at the thing in front of me. So I kind of try to read stuff on the periphery. Or it's like when you're trying to come up with that, that, that on the tip of your tongue and you can't think about it. And then a few hours later, you're like, that's so-and-so. Um, so that's generally how I try to put myself into that position to, um, to make new work. But it's curiosity. I don't know what it looks like. It can live in my head, but um, I try to just do it, like in some way, getting samples of lenticulars, buying a bunch of photo stands to see what these backdrops would look like. And my bank literally called me and was like, are you okay? <laughs> like you bought seven photo stands. I mean, like they're cheap, but you know, wh what are you doing? It's like, don't worry about it, Sharon. I love that you call and check in on it, but you know my history. It's nothing suspicious. I mean, it looks suspicious. It's fine, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, so there's that. So, I, 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 yeah. It's when like the GPS tells like, you know, there's a thing up ahead, you know, you're 10 minutes slow down, but you're, you're still on the fastest track. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, they're like, it's getting worse. <laughs> recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. Um, uh, I see some, uh, some questions up here, too. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, come find me afterwards. I'd love yeah, to talk to you guys. Yeah, don't forget there'll be a book signing. There's a book signing. We got books. Everyone should buy a copy. Um, so thank you for the talk. It was very inspirational um, to see some of the cultural um, signif signifiers and such to be represented in such way. Um, my work, I, I'm a, a student here as well, so I'm working with very similar material. Um, 
the major question I have. Yeah. Uh, the major question I really have um, is with, I think you briefly mentioned with a lot, with all the things that have been going on. And like, you know, I think you mentioned how you really started thinking about making this book after the Atlantic shooting, mm -hmm. Atlanta shooting. Um, how do you, as um, you know, a member of a, com of, a, of a broader community to really uh, be an artist, to carry that, res not necessarily carry, but how to respond and how to um, interpret the situation and this time? There's no set rule or parameter how to do it properly. I think kind of similar to what I, uh, uh, or a similar phrase earlier is it's better to acknowledge that these things do happen rather to not do, like show that you're not doing anything or acknowledging those things experience. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and make work that has to respond to other things that you might not know how to answer, but you have to do, like something right and acknowledge it, not like think like it might not happen to you. I didn't even think, and then, you know, there's a lot of loss in my life. And then, you know, 20 years, well, pff, I can't math, uh, 15 years, pff, oh my God, years later, uh, it's, you know, we get the Atlanta spa shooting, we get uh, Christina Yuna Lee, and we get, um, these things repeat itself. So it's really like, I don't want to do something just to like kind of, like, this is how the way to do it. This is to right uh, wrong. That is not my job and not any of our jobs to do. We are just here to, inter here to make work to the best of our abilities and to be always curious on how to go about responding to that. I think we make our best work in quiet times and I think we make our best work unexpectedly. And these things are gonna continue to happen. So how we respond is what I'm mostly interested in. Usually the end result as a photograph is like, eh, it's I really am interested in how you got, like the process of that, honestly, at the end. How we all got there is like way more interesting than the final result. And like, I would say even my pictures, like a lot of these were like made because I wanted to see what it looked like, maybe in a Gary Winogrand way, like what the thing looks like photographed, but no one was there around to tell me um, what what I should do. And it was like, well, might as well just do what I know best. And I know photography a lot better um, than being Chinese, being queer, or being from the South, and those things like, at least I can rely on photography to point me in the right way. So not also a satisfying answer, but the poetry of it. Yeah, I think go, I think we have to go to the next room <laughs> uh, for the book signing, because I'm like, oh no, this is a long answer. Yeah, but yeah, that'll be my response for it. Um, I want to quickly say thank you so much for coming out on a Thursday night. Um, so many of you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.